Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Jane. This is episode 200. Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of Learn True Health Podcast. Today, you're here to celebrate episode 200. This is our accomplishment, not just mine, but yours as well, the listener, because this entire operation, this entire podcast, the Learn Your Health movement is run by you guys because if you weren't here, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be doing this. I'm doing this to help change lives. My mission with Learn Your Health is to help over a million people make a huge shift in their life so they have better health mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, energetically. I want to help make a huge shift in this world and you're doing it with me. Every time you share an episode with a friend, put it on Facebook, email a, an episode to a colleague, you are helping to spread the Learn True Health mission, turning this ripple into a tidal wave and helping as many people as possible. You know, things like diabetes are 100%, if it's type 2 diabetes, for example, it's 100% reversible. ADHD is something that people don't need to live with. Anxiety, insomnia, there's so many things, chronic pain, um, digestive issues. So many people go years taking medications for something like heartburn, that there are simple and easy and effective ways to help the body bring it back into balance so they no longer have to have these problems. And in fact, my interview guest today is a PhD in nutritional science and understanding how the body works on such an amazing level. You're going to be blown away by today's episode. In fact, I took pages of notes while I was interviewing him. I know I'm going to go back and listen to this interview a few times. You're probably going to want to listen to this episode a few times because of the wealth of knowledge that Chris Master John brings to the conversation. Before we dive into today's show, I posted in the Learn True Health Facebook group the excitement I had on Monday for releasing this episode today and uh, that we're celebrating episode 200. That's a big milestone considering I'd never started a podcast before when uh, my husband encouraged me to start this podcast because of how much um, holistic medicine had made a difference in my life. Because of holistic medicine, I was able to reverse a lifelong infertility issue. And now we have a beautiful and healthy son. Uh, because of holistic medicine, I've been able to reverse, completely eliminate type 2 diabetes from my life and uh, heal so many other issues. And my husband's healed issues as well. And I've gone on to help other people through everything I've been learning and studying. Of course, now I'm a health coach and helping so many people to gain their health back that I thought, what a great medium it would be if I could interview all these heroes that in the holistic health field, these people that I look up to and I love learning from, if I could interview them so that you too could get your health back by listening and learning and implementing everything that they have to teach. And that's exactly what we've been doing. And now we've been doing it for 200 episodes. It feels like just yesterday. I look forward to doing this for years to come and helping so many people, millions of people I want to help to gain their health back. And of course, you, the listener that are listening right now, we're helping you as well. So please continue sharing this, uh, every podcast that inspires you, continue helping your friends and family. It, it may it may feel like just a little ripple effect, but you know what? That ripple becomes bigger and bigger with our efforts and uh, multiplies with our efforts. And we can turn this movement into something that helps millions of people. I just know it. I feel it in my gut and your gut is always right. Now, Christy, one of our listeners, has something she liked to share. She posted it in the Facebook group. She said, your podcast has opened my world to new information. I live in the Midwest. There's very little talk about eating whole foods. I've realized now that my grandparents did it, and somewhere along the line, it was lost. In fact, um, one of our, or the interview guest we have today, uh, Chris, shares about this This what happened? Like our grandparents, our great grandparents, they were eating whole foods, like in the Midwest, we were eating healthy. What happened? And then he talks about what triggered that. Uh, it's actually really fascinating to look at the history of our of our health and our food chain and, and where we went wrong and how we can come back to it. That's exactly what uh, Christy's talking about. She says they ate, her grandparents ate uh, organ meats. They uh, made bone broth. They were farmers, so they had raw milk, and they ate some of the animals they raised. 
My grandma was never sick a day in her life, but sadly she was gone before I could gather this wealth of knowledge from her. Your podcasts are helping me learn what I sort of grew up with and already knew but didn't pay much attention to at the time. Thanks for seeking out all the people to bring different perspectives to health. Not every plan works for everyone, right? And it's so true, Christy. And I'm living better and feeling better since following some of the information since May. It takes time, but I now realize that my health is my job. And I have upteen books to read now, too. I know exactly what you mean, Christy. I, a lot of my podcast listeners, I'll buy all the books that all the wonderful guests have. And we, we definitely have a long reading list uh, ahead of us. And, and that's a good thing because we're taking our health into our own hands. We're advocating for ourselves. And it feels so empowering. You know, my my toddler's in, um, in daycare a few days a week. I just had a great parent teacher conference and he's doing wonderful and we're doing potty training right now and and his teacher who's an amazing woman says you know as a toddler we we only have control of three things we have control of whether we sleep or not like during nap time right how much you want to fight that um the the child only has control of whether they you know choose to do nap time or not like choose to sleep whether they choose to uh what they choose to put in their mouth like they're going to either reject or accept the food and whether they go potty. And I, I realized that, you know, as adults, sometimes we feel trapped. Like we don't have a lot of choices because we've given up so much of our power. And a lot of times we give up our, our, our uh, health power over to the experts, uh, over to the doctor, and we don't advocate for ourselves. And this is this is getting our power back. This is so empowering to take the time to listen to this podcast, to read these books, to make these slow and steady health shifts in our diet and our supplementation, our lifestyle, because it's empowering you. Again, it's like feeling like a toddler that all of a sudden gets to choose whether they're going to use the potty or not, or choose if they're going to eat that apple or not. It's the only control they have in their life and your health is one of the things that you control and you can you don't have to give your control up to anyone you get to choose you can advocate for yourself and I love that I can help I can be the vehicle that helps you to gain back the power in your life Christy goes on to say I listen to your podcast as I drive to work. It's really a good use of my time and I look forward to the next episode. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. You know, your voice is the voice of many of our listeners. Um, I've heard that story over and over from the listeners about how they, they love listening, driving to work or working out or while they're doing laundry or cooking uh, because it's it's a wealth of knowledge and it's helping them come back to that place of, of holistic health, especially since we lost it along the way. I definitely know what you mean about your grandma never being a sick day in her life. And, and now we sort of lost that. Well, in today's episode, Chris Master John goes on to explain exactly why your grandma was so healthy with the foods that the organ meats and, and the raw milk and the bone broth. And he actually goes into talking about the nutritional values of certain foods. It's, it's a wonderful episode. You might even want to take notes. Uh, um, th so thankful to be here and uh, celebrating episode 200. Thank you so much for being a listener. I want to let you know that you can check out takeyoursupplements.com if you're motivated to take any supplements after uh, Chris Master John talks about certain supplements. Please go to takeyoursupplements.com, put in your information. You can talk to a supplement expert that'll help you to dial in your nutritional needs. And of course, if you're interested in becoming a health coach, we talk about IIN a little bit. If being a health coach is something that excites you, interests you, if you want to learn more information, definitely go to learntruehealth.com slash coach and check it out. I highly recommend the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. In fact, I can't say enough good things about their program. I just graduated from it. It's so amazing. You could also give them a call. Just Google IIN or the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Their phone number's right there. Give them a call. Mention my name, Ashley James, on the Learn True Health podcast because they will give you the best deal. They actually have a special for Learn True Health listeners. I made sure of that because I love them so much and I really believe in their program that I want to make sure that you as a listener gets the absolute best deal. Health coaches are changing the planet. It is the number one growing uh, career in the in 2017 in terms of the health field because people 
want that specialized and individualized attention that help, even though you as a listener are advocating for yourself and making these health choices, to have someone on your side to listen to you, to help you navigate these all these decisions, to support you, to motivate you. A health coach can do so much for you. And I, I just highly recommend either hiring a health coach or going and checking out IIN and becoming one yourself. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being a listener of the Learn Trail podcast. Keep sharing and enjoy today's episode. I am thrilled to have on the show with us today, Chris Master John, who is an expert at many, many things. One of which I'm really passionate about finally having an expert on the show about methylation. This is something that not a lot of people know about, but when you start to learn about it, uh, it, I mean, it turned my life upside down uh, when I when I started learning about methylation and the MTHFR mutation, and we'll definitely dive into that. Um, I'm also excited that this is episode 200. I can't believe it. So, Chris, you are <laughs> you're here to celebrate with us, uh, bringing in episode 200 of the Learn Trail podcast. So, welcome. That's amazing. I'm not even a quarter as many years old as that. <laughs> Well, you have such an extensive background. When I read your bio, I was throffing at the bit to get you on the show for the listeners uh, because my listeners are so into exactly what you specialize in. I'd love for you to start by sharing your story. And uh, obviously, your personal story, what led you to, to, what motivated you to become this expert in nutritional science. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to know why you wanted to go that route, and then also please share uh, a bit of your professional story as well, because it's uh, it's very exciting. Sure. So my interest in health and nutrition goes back at least to my teenage years. I saw my mom recover from fibromyalgia, where she was in chronic pain all the time through taking a diverse and multifaceted approach to healing that included things like a macrobiotic diet at one point, a lot of different herbs, a lot of uh, yogic modalities and things like that. And I, when I was a teenager, I lived with my mom. And so her being in chronic pain all the time was something I was acutely aware of. And to see the power that her, her experiences had in, in her health journey and turning around her health made me very interested. So it was always a hobby back then. It was nothing that I planned to do with my career. I read a lot about it. I talked a lot about it. But uh, it was it was really where the journey took me over the next decade that actually made this become a career for me. So when I was in my late teens, my mom and I, both being interested in herbs, started getting involved in some multi-level marketing around Uh, some herbal products and water filters and different things like that. And the crowd that we were in got us interested in the zone diet, which is Barry Sears, uh, 40% carbohydrate, 30% protein, 30% fat, um, low, low omega six, high omega three was the basic pillars of his diet. And then at the same time, Uh, I was real into radical politics and I wanted to liberate everyone, including the animals. And that got me into veganism. (laughs) And when I was vegan, having already been interested in the zone diet, I wound up getting Barry Sears' book, The Soy Zone, which he advertised in the upper left corner of the book as the healthiest zone diet ever. So I was not just vegan, but I was vegan eating a lot of soy to try to get my protein up to 30% of my calories. And, uh, you know, blame whatever you want, whether high soy, not enough animal products. I really do think that it, that it was largely driven by nutrient deficiencies. But I had several big problems, none of which were new, but they were just basically profound aggravations of existing health problems that went back further in time. So I had always been... Uh, I had already always had pretty weak digestion, but at this point I found myself often writhing in pain on the floor, probably due to my guess is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and overproduction of gas that couldn't move around enough to get to come out. So it was leading to a lot of abdominal pain. Um, I had always been vulnerable to tooth decay. Maybe I had... 
I don't know, seven cavities across my entire youth leading up to my teens. But when I was vegan, I went into the dentist's office and found out that I had over a dozen cavities and that I needed two root canals. And that was, you know, utterly unprecedented. The amount of the, the severity of the tooth decay I had, I'd never needed a root canal before. And the amount of it, I'd never gone into one appointment and found out I had more than probably two cavities to have 12 and need two root canals was, was a crazy aggravation. Plus I was older. This was when I was around 20 years old. Um, and the rate of tooth decay should be a lot lower in a 20 year old than in a seven or 10 year old. Um, so the fact that it was so dramatically worse when I was a vegan was really shocking. And then also I had always since my teenage years been quite prone to anxiety, but during my vegan years that I basically went from neurotic to borderline psychotic in terms of how much it was interfering with my health. I was very often afraid to eat any of the food in my own house. Um, lots of, you know, just, uh, downright devastating mental consequences. So when I was in college in my fourth or fifth year, I completed my bachelor's in history in five years. So, uh, somewhere around my fourth or fifth year, I was working in the dining hall on campus and my boss, Wayne, who's now my friend, gave me a pamphlet on raw milk that was produced from the farm that he got his raw milk from. And he wasn't really trying to do much of anything except say to me, hey, what do you think of this raw milk thing? And the pamphlet took me way deeper than even he had gone. So the pamphlet talked about the work of Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price was the first research director for what became the American Dental Association's Research Institute, where he spent 25 years in the laboratory studying the causes and consequences of tooth decay. After 25 years, he decided that he wanted to go kind of leave the lab, travel the world, and find populations that were largely free of tooth decay because he wanted scientific controls for the decay process and pretty much everyone in the United States at that time had terrible tooth decay. And he's doing this around, by the time he left the lab and went traveling, it was 1930s. And uh, so he's writing at the time and researching at the time where we had figured out how to refine foods into things like white flour and white sugar but we were just barely even discovering the vitamins. And so at the time, um, all people appreciated about white flour was that it was fluffy and it lasted a long time on the shelf. And no one had any idea that if you eat 80% of your diet as flour that's been stripped of all its nutrients and hasn't been fortified with anything at this point, no one had any idea how devastating the consequences would be. So nutritional deficiencies were rampant at that time and were probably the worst the world has ever seen. And so he, so tooth decay is terrible. And he goes out looking for how can I find a population that doesn't have any tooth decay? So he's trying to study tooth decay, but he inadvertently becomes one of the key pioneers of nutritional anthropology because he's one of the first people to really go around studying the traditional diets and lifestyles of people who were from societies that we didn't understand. And that's, you know, that's what an anthropologist is. And he was focusing on what people were eating. So he's really the pioneer of nutritional anthropology. And he wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And he didn't call it nutrition and tooth decay. He called it nutrition and physical degeneration because what he inadvertently studied was not just tooth decay, but the fact that before the what he called the displacing foods of modern commerce came in, white flour, white sugar, syrups, canned goods, things like that, things you could only buy in a store, uh, before that happened, people all over the world were not just largely free of tooth decay, but they were largely free of degenerative diseases across the board. And he was researching this at a very unique period in time where there were many societies on the cusp of the transition. So he was able to do things like 
go to a go to a Swiss Valley where there were people who had no contact with modern society, but then find people on the edge of the Swiss Valley, where one town of uh, had access to outside foods. But the people deeper in the valley, 10 miles away, had the exact same culture, the exact same genetics, the exact same geography, the exact same everything, except they didn't just recently gain access to modern commerce. And so they they didn't recently introduce those foods. And so he was able to really control for all of those potentially confounding variables that would have hampered his ability to actually attribute what he was witnessing to those foods. And, you know, I'm the reason I was so interested in this is because the whole theme of it is freedom from tooth decay. And my friend Wayne, my now friend, then boss Wayne had given me this pamphlet about this dude who had discovered how to be free of tooth decay right after I had gone into the dentist and found that I had a mouthful of it like never before. So I read this book because I want to cure my tooth decay. And what really, when I really discovered that I had struck a gold mine was when I accidentally cured all my anxiety disorders. And I, I didn't even realize that I did this as it was happening. But what basically the, what happened was this. I read Weston Price and I say, okay, how are these people free of tooth decay? Price says... They didn't eat refined foods. Okay, out with the refined foods. And they all focused on really nutrient-dense foods, especially nutrient-dense animal foods that are sources of the fat-soluble vitamins. So organ meats, egg yolks, insects and sm small frogs, dairy products, shellfish, etc. And I say, well, wait a second. Even before I was vegan, I wasn't even doing it right. Like I wasn't really eating much shellfish. I definitely wasn't eating any organ meats. So I start. I, I never. I never started eating frogs and insects, but I started incorporating a lot of these principles by, for example, eating liver. Uh, by, for example, utilizing the bones of the animals, and in shifting my diet towards nutrient density in these various ways. Not only did my tooth decay come to a screeching halt, but I, my, my mental health underwent this revolution, and I noticed it in one moment where I was still working in the dining hall, and I saw someone lift up a stack of plates to take a plate from the middle of the stack, and I, I just made this face at that guy, not at him, but you know, inside my head, and I judged him, and I was like, what, that, what is that guy doing? That's so weird. And then 45 seconds later, I'm just walking away and I suddenly remembered that two or three months before that, I did that every single time that I took a plate out because I was afraid of what might have settled onto the top plate. And I did things that were way worse than that. I would often spend 20 minutes looking for a glass that was clean enough for me to drink out of because I was worried that if I could find streaks or smudges, it wasn't safe. And so here I am seeing, here I am judging this guy for a very moderate instance of this totally neurotic behavior. And I, I had basically cured myself of all of that behavior so stealthily that I didn't even notice all those behaviors disappeared and I didn't even remember having them until months later when I saw someone else engage in that and I suddenly remembered um, that, that, I, that, I had, that had been a normal feature of my life. So it was really in that instant that I realized that my mental health had really undergone this profound revolution. And that was something that I was never expecting when I was doing all these things to try to help my teeth. And so it was at this point that I that I really decided that I wanted to make a career out of this. And I, I just I realized I learned so much about how to help myself that I wanted to pay it forward and help other people with what I had learned. And so the first thing that occurred to me was medical school. And uh, that summer, I graduated with a degree in history. I immediately went back and started taking chemistry classes to, to start taking the prerequisites I need for medical school. On my way through that, my professors, my friends, and my own, uh, my 
my own observations about myself and the things that I was doing all led me to shift gears from medical school to research. And that's how I ultimately wound up getting a PhD in nutritional sciences and pursuing an academic path uh, for four to five years from which I've, I've recently left to do my own thing. And that's what's brought me to here today. That is, I love your story. I, I'm, I'm so moved by it because there's so many wonderful observations you made and, and clearly you made the right move by going into research because uh, you have a way of really cutting through so much information to seeing the truth. And you, in this oh, time and time again in your story, you could just cut through all this information to get right to the truth and, and get right to the facts. Whereas most of us get caught up in the emotion. Most of us get distracted by our emotions around it, our belief system around it, and and it's hard for us to see the truth. And so you really have that that gift. And so I think uh, you definitely chose the right path to be a, a researcher. I love that you saw in yourself that a health shift towards a healthier food, uh, healthier foods for your body made a massive shift into mental health. And that is that integration that, that our mental, emotional, physical health are all related and, and that you can heal things that seem totally unrelated, like anxiety, when we focus on healing our body as a whole. Yeah. Thank you. I, 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 uh, I think I made the right choice too. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's interesting. I, I, a few points from your story, you talked about being afraid of food at that point in time when, you know, you were vegan and it, you were so in pain, um, you know, going so heavily into soy, who knows what it is, gluten, SIBO, like you had mentioned, that, that fear of food. I know a lot of people who get into that trap because they've gone from one diet to another and and they seem to need to cut more and more foods out of their life while they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, was it discovering Weston A. Price that had you able to break that fear of food? Or uh, what was the the thing that helped you to escape that? It was totally unrelated to any kind of psychological construct. So, um, I mean, I was afraid of a lot of things that uh, but like the, the the content of my phobias uh is is not really part of the story so what uh, what changed was the nutrition um I, I think when you're when you're thinking about phobias or or panic attacks or obsessive compulsive disorder then there certainly are cognitive aspects to that and there are certainly the you know the thought patterns that you have can influence either the content of your obsessions or the content of your phobias or the content of the the character of your panic attack but uh and they and certainly cognitive therapy is a well documented way to try to cope with those disorders but there's way more to it than that so the physiological milieu within your mind it is incredibly powerful. So um, one of the things that we can talk about if we talk about methylation, for example, is that methylation inside the brain has a very powerful influence on whether on the the stickiness of your mind, right? And so if you're if you're afraid of something, that fearful thought enters your mind. and if if your mind is not too sticky, it's pretty easy for you without any work to just say, you know what, I don't really like that thought and you just let it go through. Where you really need to do work around cognitive therapy, for example, is if your mind is too sticky, that thought comes in and it just gets lodged there. And you actually have to exert mental effort to reorganize how you think about that thought um, yes, that cognitive therapy is useful and it's well documented as a therapy that can treat those disorders, but it's necessary because your mind wasn't fluid and flexible enough to let those thoughts go through without any work. And if you get to the pathological extreme where your mind is so sticky 
that no matter what kind of effort you're expending, the thought just stays lodged in the center of your mind, then any cognitive work that you do is an extremely uphill battle and is a lot less likely to be successful. And that has nothing to do with what you were thinking or how you were thinking about that thing and everything to do with the physiological milieu that influenced how sticky your mind is. And if you think of a panic attack, really a panic attack is a, is a positive feed forward loop of panicking about panicking. So you can, you can have a panicking thought that enters your mind. And if you just say, I'm not going to listen to that thought, then um, maybe there are some new neurotransmitters that spike and make you flutter a little bit. Maybe you got a little pump of adrenaline out of it or something, but then it didn't do anything else. But if you're afraid of that panic and then you worry that that panic is an indication that your world is about to fall apart and you panic about the panic, then the, the, the panic increases and the increase in panic reinforces your belief that your world is about to fall apart. And so you panic more about the increase in panic. You have to have a pathologically sticky brain for even the thought of, of the, the panic, the first feeling to just stay in the center of your brain and nucleate this crystallization of increasing panic and increasing in panic and increasing panic. It's, it's like a snowball rolling where the first, the first snowball just gathers more and more snow. The first big bit of panic just rolls around in the center of your brain long enough to just accumulate more and more panic around it until you break. And so Yes, how you think about that. You can train yourself to do a lot of work to break that reinforcement by by reformulating how you think about the panic you feel. But but it's also true that if you just nutritionally modulate how sticky your brain is, the panic doesn't get stuck in the brain and so you don't have to do as much cognitive work to free yourself of it. So what happened to me was uh, was a hundred percent physiological and zero percent psychological, except to the extent that once I fixed everything physiologically, it then translated into a psychological belief that I had in fact cured myself, and that that gave me a level of confidence that I was biased towards never worrying about any of those anxieties because I believed that they were gone because they were gone. So it there's no way to completely separate the physiological from the psychological, but my but what what actually made them gone in the first place was 100% physiological for me. I love it. That is so fascinating. Um, another uh, piece of science proving that by healing the body on a uh, physical level, that it, it again affects the mind, obviously, and affects our, our thoughts, affects the quality of our life, affects the, our outcomes. I mean, it, it all comes back to making sure that our, our vehicle is, <laughs> is healthy, right? The temple that we, that we live in. Uh, Joshua Rosenthal is the creator of uh, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. It's like a health coaching school uh, that I, I just completed. And he was a counselor um, never thought he would get into nutrition, but what he noticed is when he, uh, taught his, um, clients to eat healthier, that he had a 50% faster rate of helping them resolve anything, depression, anxiety. And he saw that he was getting faster results in his counseling than his peers simply by helping them shift their diet. And he went back to his professors and talk to them about this and they all kind of poo-pooed it because this is back in the 80s when people didn't um widely accept this idea that that something as simple as shifting a diet could could um change depression or anxiety or other mental um issues and that's what led him to get so excited about food and i just think it's wonderful that now y there's so much more science around it that you can share let's let's dive into this idea yeah of well Sure. Let me stop you for just a second. My mom just completed IIN, so ah! that's kind of cool. Um, that's awesome. But 
Yeah, but I, I want to say something here. I mean, th there, this really is um, this. It's sort of bizarre because it's like there's a there's a in the scientific world in mental health. It's almost as if there's a commitment to this pre-modern science Cartesian duality to believe that the mind is something that inhabits the body. And it's really weird because I mean, certainly in psychiatry, the whole, the whole uh, basis for psychiatric drugs is the idea that um, it's entirely physiological. Mm -hmm. But there's, but you know, in the drug world, doctors are are trained to be very, uh, very enamored with the power of pharmaceutical medicines and very skeptical the, of the power of diet. And so uh, it's really just this fragmentation between these different fields, right? So if if someone doesn't like the drug world, they throw the baby out with the bathwater and they say, well, no, really the key is is all cognitive therapy and it's all, um, you know, other psycho, uh, psychotherapeutic techniques where you're dealing with more the soul of the person and reject the chemical basis for all this because it's been kind of tainted by the you know throw a drug at everything approach in psychiatry i think there are there are very few people who are really trying to cross that bridge uh s certainly one of those is emily deans who um who has a, who has her own uh blog evolutionary psychiatry and she's I think one person uh, bridging that gap, uh, but certainly on my end in nutrition, because of my experience, I also want to bridge that gap just coming from a totally different angle. And yeah, methylation is one of the first areas that I'd dive into if I were trying to bridge that gap. So we can do that now if you'd like. Yes, absolutely. You know, I had no idea that methylation affected the brain. I thought it was all in the liver. I mean, I, I, I don't know very much about it. Uh, then my naturopath tested me a few years ago and said, oh, yeah, you know, you've got M MTHFR mutation and you should make sure that your B vitamins are methylated. And um, and the second I got on methylated B vitamins, I noticed a huge shift. And I, I've been taking, you know, supplements and eating healthy for years but that that was a big shift for me, a, a big shift in my energy and mental clarity, and uh, I I'm I'm quite excited to learn more about it. And I know so many people have no idea about it, um, so please uh, dive in. Sure. Uh, so, quick question: What do you, do you know? What your MTHFR status is uh, in detail? Do you know which which mutations you have? I what I remember is that is that there's like two branches that branch out again. So there's like four in total, and I'm I'm um twenty five percent on one and twenty five percent on the other. So <laughs> she drew it out for me, and then okay. was, it was a, it was about three years. So you've ago. got a fit, you've got like a fifty percent decrease in MTHFR activity, yes. something like that. Okay, um yeah. So so I mean interest. So MTHFR is just one aspect of this. I don't have any MTHFR mutations, and uh, interestingly enough, I'm. Only 15% of the population, uh, the, well, this comes from, from the Dutch population, but I'm kind of assu assuming that um, it's similar in other European ancestry and, and maybe globally. Uh, I, I don't know, but I, there's only one study from a Dutch population where I actually broke down the population prevalence in every single combination like that. Mm -hmm. And there's only 15% of the population has no MTHFR mutations at all. And, uh, and so it's really like, it's re it's not like a genetic defect. It's just, there's a graded continuum of MTHFR activity across the population where, you know, about 10% on one end have the worst activity. Most people are somewhere in the middle, about 15% have the best, uh, and it's just pretty evenly distributed across the population like that. And so the 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 number the, probably about half the population has a fifty percent decrease or greater, you know, so you, so you're um you're not a rarity by any means in that. and it's it's not really a genetic defect. It's just a relative difference in how you have to emphasize your nutrition to support your your genetic baseline. 
But but look, I don't I don't have any genetic mutations in folate metabolism at all. And I still feel that the nutrients that impact methylation have a really profound impact on my mental health. So it's not something that just people with MTHFR mutations need to be concerned about because uh, methylation plays the same role in mental health in anyone. And, um, you know, the number, like how many, uh, how much folate or how much B12 or how much choline you need will be different based on your genetics. But the fact that you need to get more than the average person is consuming in those nutrients is pretty much true for everyone. So if you're looking, so first of all, what is methylation? Methylation is just the transfer of single carbon atoms. So every piece of biology, including us, is all based on carbon. Uh, all of life is based on carbon. And almost every molecule in our body is primarily composed of carbon and hydrogen with a few other things thrown in. And so a methyl group is just a single carbon atom and methylation in the scientific literature is all often referred to as one carbon metabolism. And if everything, if all the molecules in our body are made of carbon, then you can imagine that if you need to synthesize a molecule, you often need to methylate it because that's the addition of one carbon. Or if you're going to regulate uh, molecules, you may need to methylate them or demethylate them because if you want to change something's function, change its structure. And if you got something that's mostly carbon, adding a carbon or taking a carbon away is a fundamental change to its structure and it's going to impact whether that thing is on or off. And so there's lots of things that methylation is impacting throughout the body. And sure, the liver is one of the main sites of it. That's true. But it's also very important in the brain. And a lot of the things that it's involved in are the same in the brain and in the liver and in other tissues. And if you look at what, what do you do with methylation, 45% of your methylation is used to synthesize creatine and 45% of your methylation is used to synthesize phosphatidylcholine. Creatine, a lot of your audience has probably heard of at least as a supplement that bodybuilders take or high level athletes take to either to, to basically to improve sports performance and in the context of bodybuilding to get a stronger workout so you can build more muscle in the case of sports performance to you know win the game and what people don't realize is that all of us no matter whether we're an athlete or a couch potato need absolutely need to have 2 to 3 grams of creatine newly put into our body every day and you do eat creatine, whether you take supplements or not, you do eat creatine in meat and a significant amount of it, actually. If you were to eat one to two pounds of meat per day, that's a lot of meat. But if you were to eat one to two pounds of meat per day, you would get the same amount of creatine that an athlete is taking for bodybuilding or sports performance purposes when they take a creatine supplement. So it's definitely in your food. But most of us don't eat one to two pounds of meat per day. And so the rest of that creatine that we need, we make. And the way we make it is methylation. And creatine is the most sensitive thing to the supply of methyl groups. So when you eat food, you have an incoming flux of methyl groups. More methyl groups go in um, and you start synthesizing more creatine. When you're in between meals, let's say the last time you ate meat was four hours ago, last time you ate folate in your vegetables, like all that stuff that can give you methyl groups. Um, when you're in between meals and you're fasting, the most sensitive thing that goes down is your creatine synthesis. So creatine synthesis is the most impacted thing that goes up and down over the course of fasting and feeding because, because of that. But creatine is not just in your muscles, right? Creatine is, is absolutely essential to the secretion of stomach acid. So if your creatine levels go down, you are going to have problems digesting your food because you're not making stomach acid. Creatine is absolutely essential to your hearing and your vision. When, when sound comes into your ear, these little hair-like projections are transmitting the sound into the nerves to go to the brain to make hearing. And that's an energy intensive process. And just like creatine is helping energy metabolism in the muscle, 
creatine is helping energy metabolism in these hair-like projections because one of the things that makes creatine really good at energy supply is that it moves really fast. So if you have a really long cell, like these hair-like projections in your ear, the creatine can go back and forth shuttling energy about 2,000 times faster than ATP can. And ATP is the most famous uh, you know, energy currency of all cellular metabolism. Everyone neglects creatine, which has these really important properties. It does the exact same thing in the cells of your eyes, also because they're really long and they need something that can shuttle energy back and forth really quickly to transmit vision into your brain. Now, in the brain, some people, there's some science indicating that creatine might be a neurotransmitter, but what's absolutely clear is that creatine, um, 10% of the creatine in your body is in your brain, and it plays the same role in energy metabolism that it does everywhere else. And your brain is an enormous consumer of your body's energy metabolism on a day-in, day-out basis. And if the energy metabolism in your brain is failing, well, you're not, your mental health is not gonna is gonna be very challenged. And there's there's one study showing that if you so, so if you have someone with depression, right, they're all going to get serotonin drugs, SSRIs. And so that's like the ethical standard in the, in the United States anyway. And so th there was one study where they took people with women diagnosed with major depressive disorder and they put them all on SSRIs, but then they randomly allocated all those women to also have either creatine or placebo capsules that looked exactly like the creatine. And what they found was over the course, uh, starting at two weeks and through the end of the study at eight weeks, you basically got double the reduction in depressive symptoms with the creatine than without. And so that's pretty profound, um, pretty strong evidence that creatine is playing a role in protecting against depression. And creatine supplementation is one way to think about that, but also, how do you make your own creatine? With methylation. So if your methylation is failing, uh, you're not gonna make enough creatine. But also, um, neurotransmitters are metabolized through methylation. And one of the things we were talking about before was the stickiness in your brain. Well, methylation controls the levels of dopamine in your brain in a way that influences how sticky your brain is versus how um, how fluid it is. And what you really want is a nice balance between those because if your brain is too fluid, you can't focus on anything. But if your brain is too rigid, you can focus on all the right the, all the wrong things, right? So you want the freedom if a negative thought or emotion or or, mental framework enters your mind, you want the freedom to let it go. But when you have something that's highly motivating to you and you want to stay focused on that task so that you can accomplish something or succeed in something, you want that to stick in your brain. So in order to have that, that level of freedom, you need this uh, moderate degree of malleability that allows things to come in and out, but also it has enough substance to it that you can hold on to what you need. And that means that you want just the sort of Goldilocks amount of methylation of the dopamine pool. If you if you methylate too much dopamine, then you will become too mentally fluid and you will become easily distractible and you won't be able to focus. If you don't methylate enough dopamine, you will become mentally rigid and you will become a victim of your thoughts because anything that enters your brain will not be able to leave your brain unless you put in a lot of cognitive work to try to break down that stickiness. And if you're putting in that all that cognitive work, you're more likely to get mentally exhausted, right? So what you want is this optimal methylation of the dopamine pool. And the way that you, there's two aspects to that. One is that you want to methylate enough dopamine and you need nutrients like folate and vitamin B12 and choline to make sure you're methylating enough. But then on the other hand, you want a buffer system to make sure you don't methylate too much. And the natural buffering system is to take the amino acid glycine and 
vacuum up any extra methyl groups so that you always, as long as you have enough promethylation nutrients and you have this glycine buffer in place, you always get that Goldilocks amount of methylation that you want to get that right balance. Now, glycine is a very underappreciated nutrient when it comes to methylation. Glycine is mainly found in skin and bones. And by, you know, by eating sort of nose to, to tail, so to speak, by utilizing the skin and bones of the animals that we eat, that's one of the best ways to get that glycine in there. But glycine itself is a calming nutrient. So inside the brain, glycine acts on um, it, it basically there's so there's an amino acid called glutamate and glutamate inside the brain is excitatory and glycine n sort of antagonizes that exciting effect and calm has a calming effect. And so in insomniacs, it's been or people with poor sleep also, it's been shown that three grams of glycine before bed at night will um, will promote better sleep. And even though it has a calming effect, it makes them more alert and less fatigued in the day because their sleep is better. In, in real pathological conditions, you have excesses of glutamate. That's true in epilepsy. It's true in bipolar. Uh, one place where glycine has been studied is in schizophrenia, and they've shown that 60 grams of glycine will have an antipsychotic effect in schizophrenics. Now, you so you want to eat enough glycine but one thing that i think is is really underappreciated about mthfr which you brought up before mthfr is the enzyme that you need to methylate folate and and if you have low mthfr you will cut off the supply of methyl groups and so um it does make it harder to methylate things but what people usually don't know is that methylfolate is actually the off switch for the glycine buffer system. And if you don't have enough methylfolate, your body will get tricked into thinking that it has too many methyl groups. And so it winds up wasting glycine and you pee out the methylated glycine metabolites in the urine. And one of the benefits of supplementing with methylfolate in that case is not just supplying the methyl groups, it's shutting off that glycine buffer system. And so if you're wasting glycine, you're more likely to lose the calming effect. You're more likely to have insomnia. You're more likely to have poor sleep. Even if you get sleep, it won't be as restful and you'll be more fatigued during the day. You'll be less alert. So glycine is, is really important in that way. Um, Similarly, we we're just talking about dopamine, right? If you're overmethylating dopamine, you're going to be more distractible. And so, if you don't have the, if you're wasting glycine because of MTHFR, or you're not eating enough glycine, for example, um, you could overmethylate the dopamine pool and become very vulnerable to that distractibility. Or if you imagine someone who doesn't get enough methyl groups in their diet, maybe they don't get enough folate or B12 or choline, and they don't get enough glycine they could be a seesaw, right? They have an influx of methyl groups and, um, you know, for like suddenly they're methylating enough dopamine, but then it goes a little bit overboard and they're methylating too much and they're seesawing back between too much mental rigidity, too much distractibility. Um, those can be problems as well. And then the final thing, um, actually two more things that are really important for mental health. So first of all, histamine. We histamine is famous for allergic reactions. Well, that's what it does outside your brain, but inside your brain, histamine promotes alertness, and in excess, it promotes uh, panic attacks and anxiety disorders. So histamine is another one where you want the methylation to be just right. You don't want to methylate so much. Uh, methylating histamine gets rid of it, right? So you don't want to methylate histamine so much that you get tired and sleepy. That would be like taking a Benadryl where you antagonize the alertness effect of histamine in the brain. Um, but you don't, you don't want maximum histamine. If you're not methylating enough histamine, that alertness is going to be, is going to translate into the more extreme form of anxiety or panic attacks. And then the last thing is choline itself, right? If you don't, uh, choline is 
a nutrient that you can use to support methylation, generally about half of your methylation comes from choline and half of it comes from folate and B12. Well, if you're B12 deficient or you're folate deficient or you have an MTHFR mutation, that half doesn't work as well. So you wind up using a lot more choline. And there's nothing wrong with using choline for methylation if you're eating enough choline. But if you're doubling up how much you use for methylation and you don't eat extra choline, you're depleting yourself of choline. And choline is uh, does uh, choline is also used for the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and that does a ton of things. But one of them is it provides muscular energy when you contract your muscles. It's acetylcholine telling your muscles to contract. And inside the brain, it's really important for your cognitive performance at sustained tasks. So you want the right balance of dopamine to be able to focus on the right task, to be able to mo be motivated for it. But then when, when you do s focus on that task in order to do well at it, to provide sustained attention during that period of motivated focus, that performance, that ability, that focus all comes from acetylcholine. So methylation is impacting creatine, histamine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and glycine. And that's five things that all have really impactful uh, effects on mental health. That, that is amazing. Um, my mind is kind of spinning right now. Is this, is any of this epigenetics? Can, can someone, you know, through nutrition, uh, become better at methylation or am I, am I from birth stuck with the, the, the MTHFR, um, that I have now? Is there, is there any way or have you ne observed? Neither, neither, neither. Right. So, um, it's not, it's not, you're not a victim of your genetics, and this is really unlikely to have any effect on epigenetics except in extreme circumstances. So I think we should clarify those terms. A lot of people think of the term as epigenetic as something that is altering the expression of your genes, and that's um, that's not really the the right way to think about epigenetics. So epigenetics is modification, structural modifications to the genome that have long, usually long term effects on gene expression. Uh, not necessarily, but so for example, you can have a you may you can have a gene for. Uh, well, let's take cancer for example. There's a lot of genes that if they are expressed cause cancer. They're called oncogenes. Those are genes that you want to not be expressed. And so you have all kinds of structural alterations to the actual DNA inside your cell that you can use to more or less permanently not express that gene. And if you succeed at making that permanent, that will prevent you from getting cancer. And methylation absolutely influences that. So methylation of genes is one of the things that silences them. And if you methylate uh, a, a cancer-causing gene and you don't express it because of that, that is technically epigenetic and that is very impactful on health. And it's something that could go wrong with, with, um, with, with methylation. But generally, because of MTHFR or because of nutrition – that is like the last thing that would be altered compared to these other things we've been talking about. And the reason is you always have fluxes of methyl groups going in up and down whenever you whenever you eat food. If you eat a steak, you have the amino acid methionine, which is which has its own methyl group and supplies that methyl group to the methylation cycle. Um, and you just ate a ton of it, right? So you have this sudden increase in methyl groups. Not only that, but you ate vegetables and you got your methyl folate with that steak. Like all these, you ate a few eggs and you got the choline coming in with its methyl groups. These methyl groups are coming from your food. I mean, even besides that, when MTHFR adds a methyl group to methylate folate, it takes it from other amino acids. Where do, you, where do you get amino acids? In your diet, right? So methyl group supply is always really high when you eat food. And then four hours later, methyl supply goes down a lot. 
you do not if if your goal is to use methylation to silence this cancer causing gene you do not absolutely do not do not do not want your methylation of that gene to go down at all between meals right you do not want to be anti cancer when you just ate a steak and then become pro cancer because you haven't eaten in 4 hours you want to be anti cancer all the time so your body regulates the supply of methyl groups so that when methyl group supply is low, you continue to maximize your methylation of that cancer-causing gene, and you stop methylate, you stop synthesizing creatine. Why do you stop synthesizing creatine? Because your goal for creatine synthesis has nothing to do with the moment that it's synthesized. It has everything to do with over the course of a few days, you want to make as much creatine as you lost in your urine as creatinine. Um, so this, this every day you have about two or three gram in your body right now. You have a, about 120 grams of creatine. Today you will lose two or three grams because it will spontaneously degrade into creatinine and you'll pee it out. If you get markers of kidney function, they'll look at your blood levels of creatinine to see if you've been peeing it out. And if you look at the measurement of anything in your urine, they'll express that measurement as a ratio to creatinine because this constant loss of creatine as creatinine is this constant feature that affects all humans all the time. And your goal with methylation is to net net make up for what you lost on average. So you can imagine in your muscles, if you lose two or three grams of creatine in a day, if you have 120 grams in there, then between, let's say you ate breakfast and it's four hours later. Well, in that four hours, what did you lose in total creatine amount? Maybe 200 uh, milligrams or something like that. So maybe your muscular creatine stores went from 120 grams to 119.7 grams. That makes like zero difference in your muscular function. And you're just going to eat another meal. And when you eat lunch, you make more creatine and you make up for it. So it didn't matter. It's, you know, if you compare that to something like I expressed the gene that makes me get cancer four hours after breakfast, and then I ate lunch and it turned off. And then four hours later, it turned back on. And then I, then I slept for eight hours and didn't eat anything. And the cancer gene was on the whole time. Like that's a disastrous scenario. So the, the, when you're talking about epigenetics, these are not really dictated by the supply of methyl groups. They're dictated by your body's own desires to regulate those genes and how they're expressed. And your body prioritizes methyl groups so that unless you have this extreme scenario where the methyl group supply drops to zero, you're pretty much going to exclusively control genetic epigenetic phenomena with your regulation of the enzymes that perform those epigenetic roles. Now, a lot of people, um, to pull away from that a bit, a lot of people confuse epigenetics with anything that has an effect on your body that isn't genetic. And that really belongs in a different category. So with MTHFR, you will never alter the fact that your MTHFR enzyme is 50% lower than someone that doesn't have any mutations like me. But all that means is that you just have a different nutritional emphasis. So if your MTHFR, there, there's, a, there's a handful of things that you can do to re shift the emphasis on your diet to make up for that. So one of those things is that when you have lower MTHFR activity, methylfolate is your off switch for the glycine buffer system. So you tend to waste glycine and pee it out. That means you need to put more emphasis on dietary glycine because you're likely to be losing it. And so things like using bone broth or bone stock can be kind of the entryway into getting more glycine. Actually eating edible bones when they're soft enough to be edible is another way. If for some people, sup the supplements that can help are glycine itself or something like a hydrolyzed collagen supplement, for example. 
Um, any of those can help with that. Also, getting enough methylfolate can help pre prevent the glycine wasting. And so on that end, you just need to put a lot more emphasis on eating folate-rich foods. And that folate-rich foods, I like to think of the three L's, liver, legumes, and leafy greens. Um, it's not really leafy greens. It's just greens, right? Broccoli is a flowery green, and that's a good source of folate. Kale is a leafy green, and that's a good source of folate. But liver, legumes, and greens basically are, are – if you eat two to three servings of those foods every day, that's a good way to get the amount of folate you need. And you might want to add a small methylfolate supplement to that. That's going to help shut off that, that glycine wasting by getting the folate in there. I also think it's good to try to reduce the tax on that pathway because you want to actually reduce you, – you, you really cannot, absolutely cannot – make up for the methyl group supply by eating, by supplementing with methylfolate or methyl B12. To, to give you an example of how implausible that is, when you eat a molecule of folate, it goes into your cell and stays there for 180 days. Every day, it gets remethylated from your amino acid supply 18,000 times. There's no way on earth you could make up for losing that methyl, that endogenous methylation. You would have to eat 18,000 times the RDA for methylfolate, and that's probably not even safe. So you what what you what you want to do is get enough methylfolate in there to shut off the glycine wasting and then conserve it. How do you conserve it? Well, number one, you reduce the need for methylation. The number one hugest, biggest standalone thing you can do is get enough creatine. Like I said before, if you're trying to maximally make up, uh, maximally reduce the need to synthesize creatine, uh, about three to five grams of creatine is a supplement a day or one to two pounds of meat per day. It's hard to get one to two pounds of meat. It might displace a lot of other foods you would want to get in the diet. And, and actually when you eat meat, you actually raise your need for glycine that you would get from the other, you know, the bones and the skin of the animal. So eating two pounds of meat is probably not the best idea for someone who has MTHFR, but um, supplementing with creatine is, is a, a very um, underappreciated way to try to help conserve the methylfolate supply that you're, that you're also taking. And uh, in fact, I have some clients who felt like they were bouncing around between undermethylated and overmethylated states for years until they started using creatine supplementation to try to stabilize um, to try to stabilize that seesaw effect and it's been very effective. And then the last thing is having reduced MTHFR activity kind of more or less doubles your need for choline. So if you have uh, the 75% decrease in MTHFR, which is the worst case scenario, that basically doubles your need for choline, which means you should get about 1,200 milligrams of choline a day. If you, in your case you have 50%, so it's not quite as severe, but you should probably be getting about 900 milligrams of choline a day instead of 1,200, and that's going to um, that's going to allow you to number one, conserve your methylfolate because you're putting more emphasis on the pathway that doesn't require methylfolate. So you're not using up as much in the other part of the pathway, but also it makes sure that you're not sucking up all your choline into that process at the expense of your acetylcholine levels. Because the last thing that you want is to use all your choline for methylation and then not have enough acetylcholine to give you the, the focus and cognitive performance that you need for tasks requiring your sustained attention or the acetylcholine that you need to feel strong when you contract your muscles. So those aren't epigenetic. Those are nutritional. Um, but that nutritional effect is why you are absolutely not a victim of your genes. I love it. It's so funny you should say that about eating the soft bones and, and eating even the collagen. Since I was a child, that's I wanted I always would gnaw on the bones and just crave the 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 
the crunchy bits, the collagen um, from the chicken bones. And uh, we'd make oxtail and I'd have to chew the bones. It's just very, it's very interesting that you say that because my body was, was telling me that's what I needed. Um, you mentioned that uh, supplementing with a small amount of methylfolate um, would be of benefit. Um, how much per day would someone take, uh, should someone take perhaps if they're 75% or they're 50%? Um, I would, I would approach this in a three step manner. So the first thing is make sure you're getting at least the recommended intake of folate from foods. Most people don't even get the, the U S RDA for folate. And uh, I mean, especially if they're pregnant or, or lactating, which is why it's the policy to give everyone prenatal vitamins that have synthetic folic acid in them. And this can be even more true for people who are health conscious. And so they throw out the white bread. So I, I don't, uh, you know, this probably isn't the case in other countries, but in the United States, flour is fortified with synthetic folic acid as a means of reducing a certain type of birth defect called neural tube defects. And it's been effective. Uh, but you know, a, a lot, there's, there are, there are some arguments against folic acid because it's synthetic. It doesn't exist in the food supply. It puts extra stress on your body's certain metabolism, et cetera. But it, it is a good way of preventing frank folate deficiency. And there's a lot of people who are health conscious and they say, well, I'm going to not eat white bread anymore. And then the question is, okay, well, what are you eating instead? Um, if you're not eating fresh greens and or liver and or dried legumes, then you're probably suffering a big drop in your folate status. And one thing that can really catch people is if they – cut out the white bread, and then they start eating frozen vegetables because uh, folate is not stable in vegetables in the freezer. And if you have frozen vegetables and they're frozen for three or four months, oftentimes the most of the folate is obliterated by that time. And you don't know how long your vegetables have been frozen before you bought them. So you really can't make up a rule like I'm just going to freeze them for one month and eat them all or even one week because for all you know, they were already frozen for three to four months before you bought them. So um, it's it's really easy to envision someone who's trying to be health conscious and isn't eating anywhere near enough folate. And that person's first step should not be to take a methylfolate supplement. It should be to start eating enough folate. So step number one is just to make sure that you're eating two to three servings of the three L's, liver, legumes, and leafy greens a day. Obviously, it's not going to be three servings of liver a day. It's maybe one or two servings of liver a week as a substitute for the legumes and leafy greens. And then um, there is some evidence that if you sprout the legumes, that on the fourth day, they increase in folate by three to six fold. So, I mean, maybe if you had four days sprouted legumes, you could eat like a half a serving of them and get all the folate you need. But I'm not ready to really depart from my two to third, three serving recommendation right now because um, let's say you buy a package of sprouted lentils at the store. I don't have a clue how many days they were sprouted for. When I've asked companies, they tell me it's proprietary. And um, the research shows that on the fifth day, the folate starts going back down. So I can tell you that you're going to get more folate if you eat sprouted legumes instead of unsprouted ones. But I'm not really willing to alter that recommendation to get two to three servings a day. Also, uh, if you eat eggs, eggs are a half-decent source of folate when they're commercial um, grass is a leafy green. So if the chicken is eating grass instead of corn, the chicken's going to have much better folate status and the egg is probably going to be a lot higher in folate. And there's some really kind of shaky anecdotal evidence um, that a pasture-raised egg might be just as good as a serving of liver or a serving of legumes or a serving of leafy greens all I'm really ready to say is 
eat past your egg yolks when you can, and you're probably getting better folate status, but I'm not willing to put a number on that yet. Um, so start there. That's step one. Step two is take about the US RDA for folate as methyl folate. And so, you know, add to your liver legumes and leafy greens 400 micrograms of folate. That's a little higher if you're, if you're, um, a woman of childbearing age, you could go up to 600. But I mean, if you're already eating four or 500 from food, I would just say add, add a 400 microgram supplement. But then that's step two. Step three is you tailor this to your needs, right? This is just a blueprint for what on average people should expect to need. Everyone is different, and it's there are many genes that affect methylation. It's not just MTHFR. So that, and some of those you can get reported on in your genetics, and some of them you can't, right? There's just um, some of them. There's lots of genetic mutations, and we don't know what they do to those enzymes. So you you can never just uh, take one umbrella recommendation and follow it like a cookie cutter. You have to use that recommendation and see if it works. So step three is see if it works. And I think, you know, you could go on symptoms, but the ideal thing would be to measure blood markers. And what I would look at in to, to see if you're getting enough folate is, number one, what are your methyl folate levels? And if you measure folate in the serum or plasma, but not in your red blood cells, you're looking at your methyl folate levels. In fact, it would probably be be really good if you measured it in either serum or plasma and in red blood cells, because in red blood cells, it is more reflective of the total folate pool, and in serum or plasma, which is outside of your cells, it's more reflective of methyl folate exclusively. And so if your um, if your red blood cell folate is low, you just need more folate in general. And if your serum or plasma folate is low, then you need more you either need more methylfolate or you need to conserve it better, right? So like I said before, the creatine supplementation could help conserve it. The choline, getting enough choline could help conserve it. Um, and, and so if, you're, if, like, if your total folate levels are normal and your methylfolate is low, you either need to conserve it better or you need to increase your dose of methylfolate. Same thing then with glycine. So the ideal thing would be to get a plasma amino acids test and the two things you'd want to look for are glycine itself, which is that amino acid that you get from skin and bones, and which is that buffering system, the amino acid that takes away extra methyl groups. When glycine is methylated, it turns into a compound called sarcosine. So if you look at a plasma amino acid analysis that has those two amino acids, if your glycine is low and your sarcosine is high, then that means that your glycine buffering system isn't switched off enough. And what switches it off? Methylfolate. So that's the other half of the coin, right? Like, do your methylfolate levels themselves look low? And then also, does your glycine buffering system look switched off? And that means your glycine is right in the middle of the range and your sarcosine is really low. If that's not true, if your glycine is low and your sarcosine is high, then that means that you need to better shut off that glycine buffering system and that could mean everything we said before. Either you need to conserve your methylfolate better or you need to increase your dose of methylfolate. And, um, and in the meantime, as kind of a crutch, you probably also need to increase your dose of glycine because keeping your glycine in the middle of the range is important not just um, as that buffering system, but also glycine is a calming pro-sleep antipsychotic neurotransmitter in the brain. So um, you want enough glycine because you don't want to be psychotic and you want to be calm and you want to get good enough sleep to feel rested and alert during the day. You mentioned um, uh, creatine as a supplement, of course, you know, if, if one could eat enough meat, um, but then there's that imbalance of, of uh, glycine that happens when we do eat. Uh, too much meat. So if someone wanted to take your advice and supplement with creatine, you said between three and five grams as a supplement, what form should that come in? Um, do we just look for a bottle that says creatine or is there a, a, a more? Uh, search. Yeah, I would search for Crea Pure. 
Um, creatine monohydrate is the main form of creatine that's the one used in all the studies. And Crea Pure is the purest creatine on the market. Crea Pure is made by one company that then is resold and repackaged by many other companies. So um, the sign of quality is if the supplement contains Crea Pure powder and nothing else in it, in which case all of the ones selling pure Crea Pure powder are all the same. So then it comes down to uh, where do I live and what's the most convenient way to get it shipped to me or or can I buy it in a store? What does it cost? And I would just make the rest of the decisions on convenience and cost. And in terms of choline, you'd said uh, for those who have a 75% MTHFR mutation that they take 1,200 milligrams daily. For those with a 50% mutation, they take uh, 900, 900 uh, milligrams daily. What form of choline is the most bioavailable or would you recommend? Uh, I think by default you want phosphatidylcholine, and that's because most choline in food is phosphatidylcholine, and, um, and it's just more natural. And also there's some concern – and I don't really buy into this too strongly, but there's some concern that choline, if you eat it in doses that don't get fully absorbed in the small intestine, can be turned into some nasty byproducts in the colon. And again, like I said, I'm not really convinced by that science, but at the same time, I know that phosphatidylcholine has the best absorption in the small intestine and is the least likely to be degraded into nasty byproducts in the col in the colon. So I, I kind of like to err on the side of safety. Like maybe there's some truth to that research. And if there is, you protect yourself by taking phosphatidylcholine. Now, things get a little bit complicated from here. Uh, well, I'll mention one other thing. If, if you believe that you have the symptoms of low acetylcholine levels – which I would say are, to make it a little simple, I would say muscular weakness and the inability to perform well at cognitive tasks requiring sustained focus um, or problems with your memory. Any of those problems indicate that your acetylcholine levels might be low. If that's the case, I would take that dose of choline as alpha GPC, which is, it stands for alpha glycerophosphocholine. And that is uh, a form of choline that is far more quickly and effectively turned into acetylcholine than any other form of choline. So, so the, the two choices are number one, the default phosphatidylcholine. Number two, to treat what seems like acetylcholine deficiency because of memory poor cognitive performance or muscular weakness, alpha-GPC. Now, if you're doing phosphatidylcholine, there are some complicating factors that you need to consider when navigating the supplement sales. So first of all, uh, phosphatidylcholine supplements tend to tell you how much phosphatidylcholine is in the supplement and not how much choline is in the supplement. So when I say 900 or 1,200 milligrams, I mean of choline not of phosphatidylcholine. And the phosphatidylcholine molecule is only 15% choline. So you can get a supplement that tells you that it has 1,000 milligrams of phosphatidylcholine. What it doesn't tell you is that it only has 150 milligrams of choline in it. So um, it's, it's pretty difficult to use phosphatidylcholine capsules to get that because the number of capsules you have to take are get pretty ridiculous to get 1,200 milligrams of choline. And I actually think the best way to do that is to find a high-quality lecithin granules. And if you um, if if you if you're so if you're allergic to soy, then there's sunflower lecithin. If soy is not a problem for you, there's soy lecithin. About four to five tablespoons of the granules supply that amount of choline. And that, you know, if you like smoothies, like blending that into a smoothie is a pretty easy way to do that. And then, of course, there's food. So to get four to, f uh, to get um, 900 to 1200 milligrams of choline from food, you could eat four to five egg yolks a day. You could substitute a serving of liver, for, and those can be whole eggs, right? But they can't be whites. They could be all the choline's in the yolk, so it could be just four to five egg yolks. It could be four to five whole eggs. 
Or you could replace two of those eggs with a serving of liver. And then the other thing that you can do with food is you can get 10 servings of uh, – when I say servings, I'm thinking of 100 grams, right? So one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of low-carbohydrate plant foods such as nuts, seeds, and cruciferous vegetables, then you're – probably getting um, close to that amount of choline. It would be a good idea to kind of track your um, what you're actually eating and look it up in a nutritional database to make sure because it's not um, an even spread. But generally, um, those foods tend to, to be pretty high in choline. And then also, there is something else in the diet called betaine, which some people might call betaine whatever. So betaine, B-E-T-A-I-N-E, when you use choline for methylation, you actually turn it into betaine first. And it's actually betaine that you're using for methylation. And that means if you eat betaine, you can use that instead of choline, and then you spare your need for choline. And so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't 100% replace all of your choline with betaine, but um, you could certainly replace a large chunk of it, maybe up to half of it. And um, there's the, the equivalence that I just gave in choline, the equivalence to get that amount in betaine would be five 100 gram servings of spinach. There's just three foods, right? Spinach is one, five servings of spinach or two servings of canned beets or four servings of raw beets. Canning process does not make betaine, but it, it concentrates the beets, so there's less that you need to eat. And then 125 grams of wheat germ uh, can also supply that. So if, if you really don't want to eat four to five egg yolks or you don't want to take four to five tablespoons of sunflower lecithin or you don't want to eat 2.2 pounds of nuts and broccoli – then you can diversify by by you know mixing and matching with with those sources of betaine, and of course you, betaine is also sold as a supplement. Uh, when it's sold as a supplement, it's called trimethylglycine. These foods you're mentioning, I'm like, I could just throw this in one giant smoothie and be done for the day. <laughs> Or should we, spread, <laughs> yeah. should we spread it out throughout the day or can I just throw? You should spread it out. Okay. I you was should like, spread it out. I yep. could throw in my four eggs and my beets and my spinach and my nuts and I don't know, my cruciferous <laughs> yeah, make yeah. one giant smoothie and just I could just drink that all day long. <laughs> well, yeah, if you drink it all day long, that'd be fine. Mm. The thing is, what I was saying before that the choline, when you surpass the amount that you can absorb in the small intestine, you start generating nasty byproducts in the colon. Mm. That's more likely to happen if you take the foods all at once. And also when that does happen, that means your absorption is declining. And I don't really think anyone has clearly drawn the line of how much choline you can you can consume. And in fact, I once asked Stephen Ziesel about this, who's probably the preeminent choline researcher in the research community. Um, he's the guy who ran the research that initially showed choline is an essential nutrient in humans, for example. Uh, and I, I got the impression from emailing, but I don't want to you know, represent his views, but I'll say that what I took away from my email conversations with him was that no one really knows what the exact upper limit of choline absorption is. So it's my opinion, not hit none of this is his opinion. Every uh, <laughs> like the amounts and everything. This is all my opinion. My opinion is that without putting a number on it, the more you spread it out, the more evenly you spread it out in the day, the the better your absorption is going to be. And that's always the best rule of thumb when you can practically manage it. So, you know, sometimes it's just deeply impractical to sustain a habit if you have to evenly spread out your supplements in the day. And if that's the case for you, you have to know your own psychology and you have to do whatever is going to make the habit sustainable because the choline 
that you eat all in one meal is always better than the choline that you don't eat, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the workout that you do every day is always better than the workout that you don't do, no matter how good the workout you don't do looks on Instagram when someone else does it. (laughs) Um, It's the, you know, it's the same thing here, right? So the number one thing is first, what is sustainable for you? And then second, with within that, the more you can spread it out across the day, the better your absorption is going to be. So when it's practically feasible for you, spread it out. Now, you'd mentioned some blood tests that people could take if they really want to start dialing this in. Um, what, uh, I mean, is there, there's MTHFR. Are there any other tests to test genes that we should be aware of around methylation? My my preferred way to test the genetics is to get 23andMe and submit the data to Stratagene, S T R A T E G E N E. I you just Google that and it'll come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there are a lot of third party reportings that do the same thing with your um, 23andMe data, but I find the Stratagene report infinitely easier to read and deal with, and so that's my preferred way to go about that. Um, there are lots of genes that are unlikely to be caught by any of those reports though. So it's a way of getting important data, but you can never assume that you fully understand your genetics with something like that. And are there any labs that you particularly, um, like, like, um, specific labs that we should work with, uh, because they're more advanced or that, you know, they're more accurate. You mean companies or Hmm. particular tests? Uh, uh, Companies. Um, when you can get something from LabCorp, I think it's generally better to deal with LabCorp. LabCorp and Quest deal with really high volume stuff and they get utilized in the medical profession. And I think there's a lot more pressure on them to validate all the things that they're doing because they're way more likely than any of the specialty labs to be used for diagnostic purposes in the mainstream medical profession. And um, between LabCorp and Quest, LabCorp as a company, from my experience, is a lot easier to deal with and they're less likely to make mistakes and they're less likely to charge you twice for the same thing and all kinds of things like that. Um, so I, I think LabCorp is kind of the default to deal with for things that are available. With that said, there's a lot of specialty lab companies that offer things that LabCorp doesn't offer, and sometimes it it makes sense to go with them. So for a full panel to look to break down metabolism in a way that's very useful here and is um, useful for many other things. The Genova Diagnostics Ion Panel with 40 amino acids is a really good thing to get. That has, uh, among the things that that has, in the amino acids panel, it has homocysteine, it has glycine, it has sarcosine, and it has methionine, all of which are very helpful to, um, to analyze someone's methylation status. And it also uh, has form aminoglutamate in the urine, which is often abbreviated FIGLU and is a, a another useful marker of folate deficiency. And it also has uh, methylmalonic acid in the urine or MMA, which is a um, urinary marker of vitamin B12 deficiency. So it's, it's really good all around and it has a ton of other things in it. Um, so the Genova ion panel with 40 amino acids, I think is, is, uh, is good. And, uh, the, what I was saying before about looking at your folate levels themselves, lab core, any standard lab, but I, I would prefer to go with lab core if I, if I had the choice, uh, would offer folate both in serum or plasma and in red blood cells. So those two tests can be good. Um, I should say that a lot of people who want to order these themselves, depending on where they live, can do so on directlabs.com, in which case, by default, you're going to deal with Quest because of the contract that they have with them, which I think is okay. And um, a lot of the specialty ones, like the ion panel from Genova, it would be way easier to work with your doctor around that because if not, you're going to have to order the kit and, and try to convince 
a lab to do the phlebotomy with that kit when it's not their thing. And that's logistically a little bit more difficult to deal with. Uh, I would also say that you should always be consulting with um, a doctor or, I mean, I do have a consulting practice where I help people understand these things, uh, but you should be consulting with someone who's really knowledgeable about these pathways when dealing with these because these are not tests where you can just order them on your own and then read the report and kind of know what to do. Um, and so, and they're also pretty expensive. Like if you, you, maybe you can get your insurance to cover the ion panel, but if not, you're probably going to be $800 out of pocket. So, um, you always have to judge kind of, you have to judge how much you value having rigorous information versus how much you want to just tweak with your, with your safe, uh, action plan and play around with your supplements and see how you feel. And it's always better to test than guess, but it's not always financially feasible. And so, um, people have to kind of negotiate what they're willing to spend and go through themselves to figure out what best meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And I was going to talk about, I was going to ask about if you could work with someone after listening to you. I bet a lot of my listeners um, at some point, maybe this went over their head and they went, man, I would just like him to point me in the right direction and, <laughs> and help me dial this in. Because so many people have been misdiagnosed, have been told that they are, but they've been put in a box. You have a chemical imbalance. You have ADHD. You have insomnia. You know, you, you have brain fog or hormone issues and it, the list goes on and on. We're uh, constantly being diagnosed and then either just given drugs or told there's, there's nothing for you. You're going to have this for the rest of your life. And yet when it comes down to it, it's, it was, it was simply a nutrient um, imbalance, a nutrient deficiency. And, and we could support our body with foods and supplementation. If we know how to, if we're pointed in the right direction, based on all the science that you have, and people could then uh, their bodies heal, their bodies come back into balance, and now all of a sudden they don't have any of those symptoms. So did they ever have the diagnosis to begin with? Did they did they really have ADHD or you know insomnia or depression or any of those other things? Um, or are all of those diagnoses simply a collection of symptoms that we like to put in a box, and then and then we put that person in a box, and that person often feels um, like a victim of their diagnosis when it really is a matter of helping the body come back into balance, which is what you do, uh, working with people. Now your website, uh, definitely the links to everything that Chris master John does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast and learn com, So you can check that out. Uh, Chris master John com. I see you have a master class here. You've got a free version. Um, you have a blog, you have a podcast that the listeners should absolutely check out. I want to talk about that in a second. And you do consultations. You have a lot of great information on, on your website. I definitely think that, um, oh, and you have some information on ketones, man. I could have you back on the show for sure. Uh, <laughs> all the things we could dive in and talk about. Um, I love, I love, love, love the wealth of knowledge you bring and you're, I love that you are bringing, bringing light to the fact that, uh, shedding light on the fact that holistic, holistic minded healing is, can be so science-based, can be so grounded that the things that our grand, you know, grandma's told us to do, like e eat liver, right? And eat our vegetables, that it has a tremendous impact on our, on our health. And now you can prove it. And it's just, it's, it's so much fun to see something, see a shift in someone. Um, have you, have you, do you have any stories of success you'd like to share in terms of working with people where they've made a, a huge shift in their life because of something as simple as shifting their food and supplements? Um, you know, honestly, like I, I really don't think most of the, the people that I work with have, have, um, dramatic shifts like that. I think that's really common for people to have, um, dramatic, uh, shifts when they're chasing after a low hanging fruit. And I'll say like, you know, I, I, in my personal experience 
had gone uh, I had kind of pushed myself into this really dramatic uh, leftward slope towards negative mental health and everything that I described before. And I had a, I had this miraculous change in reading a book because those simple changes were um, they were just a, a night and day change in terms of what I was doing with my diet and the reason that I had those mental problems were so simple. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, to be honest, like most the people that come to me that I spend a lot of time working with are quite often not in that category at all. I think the people who have dramatic light night and day changes are far more likely to have had them because of something that I wrote than because of my than because of coming to me as a consulting client because usually no one comes to me as a consulting client unless they've mm. been very familiar with my writing over time, right? So there's a lot of people that give me feedback like, wow, I read this one thing that you wrote about vitamin K2, and now my teeth are totally different for the rest of my life just by making this change. Or, you know, I had a similar experience as you with, with panic disorders, and then I just did these things that you did, and now I'm all better. Um, the, you know, there are, there are some, uh, there are, people come to me for a variety of different reasons. I mean, I have some people who just want, um, someone to hold their hand on a weight loss journey or something like that. But then I have other people that come to me because they, uh, for literally the last 30 years, they had their life fall apart and they've gone to see, um, dozens of doctors and they've generated literally four inches, a four inch stack of laboratory data. And they, they haven't been able to make the progress they want. And they want me to figure out the next big things. And so in those cases, sometimes I'm helping people who really have debilitating issues where they've made some key insight that's uh, brought them maybe from not functioning into a place where they're no longer weak and they're now able to function, but they still have these lingering issues and it's, and it's something that we're slowly working on trying to resolve. And, uh, to be honest, like, um, that's, that's really where I'm at my best and where, where my forte is. I think, you know, in, in terms of like, in terms of giving someone some advice that can, and actually, to be honest, like when I find quick, easy solutions to things, like, for example, a lot of people used to come to me as consulting clients for managing their cholesterol. Quite often, there's something really s simple that people can do, and it's a matter of shifting the different proportions of things in their diet. So I definitely have cases where, you know, I, I made very simple changes to someone's diet and, and they're, uh, they manage their cholesterol. Like it's all done now. Um, but what do I do with that? What I do with that is I try to put myself out of business. So I realize like if I can just give people these simple things to make this dramatic change in their health, then, then as I learn what those are in, um, in my consulting, I like, if I'm telling the same, if I'm telling five people the same thing in order to get the same result and it's really simple and dramatic, then why should that be something that's reserved for people who are going to pay me $300 or $1,500 for a consulting package? Like that, if, if I have to do that over and over again, then I need to just tell everybody that. So what I try to do is I try to make it so that um, I'm always the one doing the hard work of solving, making progress on really difficult problems. And as I learn things that are simple and, and dramatic night and day changes, I try to um, basically make it so no one ever has to come to me for that because I say, hey, I'm going to tell this story on my podcast and I'm going to um, – and I'm going to just put out the blueprint for people to follow so they don't need to come to me. And, uh, that's, that's kind of how I live. So, um, I, I deliberately maintain my consulting practice for the things that are difficult. Got it. So people can really come in, come to you to dial something in after they've 
done after they've gone through all your free content and made the really big shifts um you, and you definitely want them to have made those big shifts uh because you they, they don't you don't want to have to hold their hand from you know the beginning like step one eat more vegetables uh you, you want them to have taken um action steps and taking responsibility for their health and now they need an expert to come in and help them further dial it and making that makes total sense my listeners are like that, uh, very eager to make the changes that'll help heal their body and, and live a long, long and healthy life and have healthy teeth. So it definitely, I'd love to have you back to talk about um, vitamin K2 and more about that. It'd be so much fun to have you back on the show. Your podcast is Mastering Nutrition. I highly recommend that listeners go check that out next. In fact, when this episode's done, jump back on iTunes or any of the podcast directories and uh, subscribe to Mastering Nutrition. And if you love everything that Chris said today, please give him a five-star ring and review in iTunes as well. And you can also go to Chris's website, right? ChrisMasterJohnPhD.com. That's where your podcast is as well. You mentioned that this all got started because of your mom. And then when I was talking about IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, that I just finished that training with Joshua Rosenthal, you said that your mom also just finished that training. I'd love to know, how's your mom doing now? My mom's doing great. Um, you know, it, like, it depends what you measured against, right? So, like, the she's come a she's come a long way in dealing with the fibromyalgia, for example, and she's no longer in chronic pain. Um, I think both my mom and I have some kind of genetic predisposition to muscular tightness. So, um, sh so uh, I'm sure she could be more mobile and, and could say the same thing, thing for me, but, uh, yeah, I mean, she's done really well on her journey and, um, and she's setting off as a health coach to, uh, kind of pay that forward as well. And, um, she's much more on the motivational and I'm much more on the analytical end. Very cool. Well, yes, as a, when you need a health coach, sometimes you definitely need that motivation, especially when we have to charter into un, unfamiliar territories like eating liver for the first time or cutting out gluten or, you know, uh, uh, considering. Oh, yeah, I, it's. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say considering balancing, you know, some people have never thought, you know, I need to eat three servings of this food a day to get enough choline or get enough, you know, folic acid. And, um, it can be quite overwhelming, especially like you'd mentioned before. Um, it all comes down to whether you can create that healthy habit that sticks. You want to make it easy enough so that you do because the choline or the folate or whatever nutrition you're looking to get that you do eat is better than the one that you don't eat. So figure out how to get it into your, into your, into your life as a habit and that extra motivation that a health coach brings, um, along with the science that you bring, for example, is, is a wonderful marriage. I'd love to have your mom on the show if she's looking to uh, expand her business and um, and come and share. I, I, any, any graduate of IIN is welcome on the show. Well, I'll hook you up. Awesome. Very cool. Oh, it has been such a pleasure having you on the show. Now, before uh, we let you go, I had let um, our our Facebook group, which is learn true health.com slash group, or you can just search learn true health in Facebook. And I let them know that you were coming on the show. And uh, Sandra asks, uh, cause I, I gave them your bio and she saw that one of the things you specialize in is understanding more about vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency. She said that, um, her blood tests show that she had a 20, uh, um, in, in terms of the, uh, score, which is quite low. I know nature paths like to see it around 60 or higher and, uh, MDs like to see it. I think it's between, you know, 30 and, and 50. Um, and so she was given a very high dose, uh, vitamin D supplement that she would take once a week of 50, uh, thousand international units, um, once a week for a few weeks. And she wanted to know what, do you recommend an over-the-counter dose should be uh, for ongoing, healthy, ongoing um, maintenance? And she also wanted to know your opinion about what her doctor did with this once-a-week high-dose um, vitamin D supplement, or should they have uh, given her more of a daily dose? 
They they give high infrequent doses because they're worried about compliance. And the data generally indicates that when people are prescribed nutritional supplements, they don't take it as seriously as they do when they're prescribed medications. And so the logic is that if you're worried about the person complying, it's way easier for to get them to take that once a week than it is to take it every day. The science, there's not a lot of data comparing the approaches, but the what there is suggests that uh, taking it more frequently at a lower dose is better than taking it less frequently at a higher dose. So if you know that you're motivated enough to stick to the plan, which is usually the case in people who are listening to health podcasts and participating in health Facebook groups, but it's not the case in the general population. So if you know that's you, it's better to take something daily. And so, uh, I mean, you can just take that dose and divide it by seven and you would arrive at whatever the equivalent would be, but um, probably 5,000 would be plenty a day for a few weeks. Now, in terms of... Uh, in terms of maintenance, I and numbers, I don't uh, really agree with uh, any of it, starting with the premise that you can measure someone's vitamin D status like that and decide how much vitamin D they should take. And I am kind of in a camp in my own on this. There are definitely people who follow me who have more influence than I do and deal with large numbers of patients who do follow my protocol, but my protocol is basically as follows. So uh, the the level of vitamin D that you have that she has measured, that I would have measured, that anyone would have measured as vitamin D status, the bottom of that range is set based on what will maximally suppress your parathyroid hormone or PTH. And PTH is made by your parathyroid glands, which are glands that, like it sounds like, they sit on top of your thyroid gland, which is a butterfly-shaped gland in your neck. So these are four little glands on each wing of the blood butterfly, so to speak. And uh, they have nothing to do with thyroid hormone, but they just happen to be on top of the thyroid gland. That's why it's called parathyroid. And their job is to determine whether your calcium and vitamin D is adequate. If your calcium and vitamin D levels fall below what your body thinks they should be, you make more PTH. And so what they did to determine the reference ranges for the vitamin D is they just measure PTH and, and vitamin D status in thousands of people and then plotted it all on a graph. And the data is really noisy, but there's a general um, shape where as vitamin D goes up, PTH goes down and it keeps going down and then it hits a bottom and it plateaus. And so they just said, okay, where's on average the point of maximal suppression of PTH? And then they pegged it and they said, ah, it's about 30. Let's make that the bottom of the reference range. So my opinion is that vitamin D needs vary widely between different people. Uh, to begin with, on a population average, it's very clear that white people of European ancestry have higher needs for vitamin D than pretty much everyone else in the globe. And if you look at people like in Hawaii, if you look at white people, Asians, and people of mixed ancestry in Hawaii who are young, fit, healthy, who go outside wearing almost no clothing and wearing no sunscreen, for dozens of hours a week, the the white people have vitamin D status in the 30s and the Asians have vitamin D status in the 20s. And so actually having 20 is pretty low, but for an Asian person or a black person or pretty much anyone besides white European ancestry um, to have like 28 actually isn't that low. And the key thing that you would want to look at, in my opinion, but now let me back up a second. That's just a population average, right? There's just there's just a proportion of genes are spread differently in white people versus Asian people versus black people, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not it, but it has nothing to do with the with the racial identity, right? So there are some white people who need less vitamin D. There are some Asians who need more vitamin D. And so um 
it really is a matter of figuring out the individual person's need. And my opinion is, why guess at that? Why don't you just measure the person's PTH? Because the PTH, the parathyroid gland, like, you know, um, Ashley, how many times a year do you measure your vitamin D status? Uh, once a year. Okay, so your parathyroid gland is continuously monitoring your calcium and vitamin D levels, and it responds within milliseconds to initiate some change. I don't know how many milliseconds there are in a year, but that's basically how many times your <laughs> parathyroid gland is measuring your blood levels, right? And so it's it's like, why trust the once a year measurement versus your resident expert on your calcium and vitamin D status known as your parathyroid gland who takes millions upon millions of measurements a year. And so what I would say is measure the PTH level. And if the PTH level is in the bottom half of the reference range, which is basically under 30, then you probably don't even need more vitamin D. But if it's uh, in the upper half of the reference range, especially if it's above 40 or it's in the 50s or it's getting up to 60, then you definitely do need more vitamin D. So I would say measure the PTH alongside the vitamin D and then figure out what level of vitamin D status you need to maximally suppress your PTH. If you get good data on that, you can probably then simplify it and say, hey, my vitamin D is fine when it's in the upper 20s. Or you say, hey, I really need 50 or 60 uh, for my vitamin D, bef you know, for my own self. And so I think it's better to front load the task of, of getting that data to really understand your own vitamin D metabolism and then to simplify things and just take whatever the dose is that normalizes your blood work. That's going to be different for everyone. I love it. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Now, to wrap up, I definitely want listeners to check out your website because if they thought this podcast, this interview is interesting, I mean, your website is tremendous, such a wealth of information, chrismasterjohnphd.com. Um, should, where should people start? Should they start listening to your podcast? Should they start reading your blog? Should they sign up for your uh, free uh, masterclass? Where should people begin? I think that depends uh, what their motivations are and their lifestyle, right? So I'm a person who has no discretionary time to read anything. And so everything that I consume for my personal development and for fun that's outside of the work that I do is in audio format. And if you're that type of person, then I think the first thing you should do is uh, – subscribe to my Mastering Nutrition podcast. And in fact, I'm going to start distributing most of the stuff on the podcast in an audio version. Um, so like uh, a lot of the videos that I make, what I'm doing is I'm making audio cliff notes of those videos and distributing those on the, on the podcast. And so sometime in the next month, I hope to get up to like daily content where if something wasn't designed specifically for the podcast, it's summarized on the podcast. You know, so if you're like me and you just want to listen to 20 minutes of audio stuff in the morning while you're eating breakfast – Go right to the podcast and just consume all of it. Or, you know, if you only like to read, go to the blog and and just fiddle around with it. But if you're someone who has a specific goal, like you're like, geez, I really want to understand methylation better, then you should go to, to uh, my website and you should search for what you're interested in. If you're interested in methylation, for example, you could get an excellent follow-up to the discussion we had about it today by typing methylation into the search bar um, you know, or going to Google and typing my name in plus methylation, it'll do pretty much the same thing. And that gives you uh, what you'll probably get is the podcast episode that I had called Methylate Your Way to Mental Health and the other podcast that I had called Living with MTHFR. And both of those podcasts have transcripts. So if you find those on the website, then you can decide do I want to listen to it or do I want to read the transcript, for example? Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of topics that I have, you know, if you put in heart disease or you put in fatty liver disease into the search bar, you'll get something that says start here for fatty liver disease and then just walks you through the order in which you should read the things that I've written. Uh, so, uh, you know, it depends what you want, but yeah, navigate it that way. Very cool. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the show today and sharing everything. 
Um, I'm, I'm super excited to jump in and continue learning from you. I know I'm definitely going to be, um, listening to your, uh, future, all your future episodes and your daily content while I'm eating my breakfast. <laughs> and I know my listeners will as well. I, again, I'd love to have you back on the show. We definitely have more. We want to learn from you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to the Learn Child listeners, uh, to wrap up today's interview? I'll just leave it at this. Like, as you, you know, I think both of these themes, when we talked about methylation and we talked about vitamin D, really hit on the individuality that we all have. And so I think it's really important to recognize two principles. One is that my nutritional needs are not yours and yours are not mine. And the second is that my nutritional needs will someday be different than they are today. And I think if we, if we keep that open mind, it prevents us from getting stuck in a rut. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's there are some people who just never have found the right thing and they're searching and searching. There are other people who find the right thing and all of a sudden they believe that the world revolves around that thing that they found. And then uh, it, it hurts their ability to hurt other people, to not recognize that other people's needs are different, but also... Uh, if when you get stuck in a, a thought rut like that, it can really hurt your ability to hold on to the gains that you've made because someday your needs are going to change. And if you're not in tune with your body or you're not measuring something to make sure you're on track or you're just not open minded enough to acknowledge that whatever you thought was the uh, was the golden goose, like actually it's going to be something else that you need in the future, um, then you're, you're, you're vulnerable to, to not being able to reap the true benefits of what you, uh, had attained initially. So keeping an open mind to recognize that these needs can really vary from person to person and within a person over time, I think is a great take home point to, to arrive at. Absolutely. We're continually ebbing and flowing and shifting and changing, and we need to remain um, we need to have behavioral flexibility, uh, so that we can listen to our body and, and adjust and not stay rigid. And I think that's true in diet and nutrition and also mindset in every, in every area of your life. Um, the more rigid we have, the, 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 the more rigid something is, the quicker it'll break, right? Think about the, uh, trees, you know, in the wind, when the, the more rigid they are, the more likely they'll break. And in nature, anything that has, flexibility, um, can tolerate, uh, more pressure, right? So we, we can, um, if we adapt to the mindset of flexibility, then, um, we will be able to handle the changes and the pressure as, as we adapt. For sure. Excellent. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Ashley, for having me. It was great. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back. Please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to takeyoursupplements.com and you can support us that way. You'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com or join our membership, learntruehealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself. Gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to learntruehealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? Go to learntruehealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's takeyoursupplements.com for wonderful supplements. LearnYourHealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership, which is only open for a limited time. You can get our free healthy cookbook, 
And you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you. Just go to learntruehealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page. Thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others. Let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave.